Hello Dermot, Dermot here with the CGLCC and welcome to the 2020 Digital LG BT Plus Global Business Summit. Before we get started on the session, CGLCC would like to recognize our presenting sponsor TD Bank Group along with all of our gold and silver sponsors and all of our sponsors for helping us to make this event happen. We would also like to recognize our translation partner AI Media for enabling us to deliver live caption translation in three languages, English, French and Spanish and you can access those using the links below in the description box. I'd also like to draw your attention to the left-hand side of your screen to the networking and exhibit hall tabs, where over the course of the next five days, you can connect with LGBT plus businesses, corporations, and each other to help drive that power of connection. And finally, if you do like the content we are producing, please feel free to make a financial contribution using the donate link in the description box below. Thank you and enjoy your session. Well, good morning. We uh, have a, an, a, an established and impressive group of people to inspire the next generation talking about, uh, well, I, I guess in a, in a small piece sense, uh, a small piece sense politics, but really about engagement and activism and some very impressive careers. I would say uh, many of us are first timers to using this technology today, so please bear with us if we make a mistake or have a hiccup along the way. Uh, my name is Chad Rogers. I'm going to serve as your proxy delivering questions to our uh, two panelists uh, today. Uh, we have with us uh, the 25th Premier of Ontario and the sitting member uh, for Don Valley West in the Ontario Provincial Legislature, Kathleen Wynne. Uh, additionally, uh, this morning we have Canada's Minister of Natural Resources, uh, a number of portfolios uh, on his resume already in the federal cabinet, but the sitting member for the Newfoundland and Labrador riding of St. John's Mount Pearl, Seamus O'Regan, uh, has joined us this morning. Uh, so thank you uh, first to the Canadian Gay and Lesbian Chamber of Commerce for letting us all come together this morning. We'll be soliciting your questions, so we, we'd like to use as much of the time as we have allotted this morning to making this a dialogue. Uh, you can ask questions on the uh, screen in front of you, and we'll come to them after. Uh, I, I take first dibs at throwing a couple of questions uh, at our panelists. Uh, I, I, as opposed to me reading long introductions and, and butchering the importance of your career or reading the same Wikipedia entry too many people have read about you, uh, before, I thought I would open by asking you in a few moments to tell your story. Uh, and I'm, I'm going to go to uh, the member for Don Valley West and Ontario's former Premier Kathleen Wynne first. So Premier, uh, tell us your story. <laughs> in four minutes or less, right? <laughs> yeah. yeah. Um, well, first of all, thanks to the Chamber of Commerce for hosting this. Uh, it's great to be on with you, Chad and Seamus. It's great to see you. Um, so I was thinking about what I wanted, uh, what I wanted to say to everyone today. And I always feel in these meetings that you're you're kind of talking into an abyss. But I know people are out there, and I just want to embrace you all and say hi. Um, and I'm most interested in your questions. I want to hear what you want to know. Um, so I'm 67 years old. I came out just about exactly 30 years ago. Um, and I got involved in elected politics about 20 years ago. But um, in the years before that, I was very much involved in my local community. I was involved in education, mostly uh, trying to do equity work and conflict resolution work because I felt that those were things that could really transform the experience of education for kids. Um, and so I, you know, I feel like in those years when I was getting involved in politics, my own personal journey of coming out and confronting who I was, I was, I was 37 when I came out, um, confronting that reality about myself and the work that I was doing in the community really came together. And the one without that self-examination, without having gone through the turmoil of coming out as a 37 year old and realizing that my family was going to be very different than I expected. I had three kids at the time. I was married. I lived in what they call a leafy neighborhood in uh, North Toronto. Um, if I had got, not gone through that, there is absolutely no doubt in my mind that I would never have been the premier because I never would have been in touch with 
my own power and my own ability to take space. So, um, so that's kind of the, the frame. Um, there are lots of times when kids ask me whether I, you know, whether I had planned to be the premier, whether that was something that I thought about when I was a kid. It absolutely wasn't. Um, I, I didn't think about electoral politics necessarily as something that I wanted to do, but I, I knew that I wanted to fight for a stronger education system. I knew that I wanted to, to fight for a, a more fair community. And so that, that led me to politics because in Ontario, when our education system was being undermined, through that equity lens, I got involved and then that led me to put my name on a ballot. So. Um, once I did that, once I put my name on a ballot, once I knew that that was going to happen, I had to work with my own family and my kids to deal with the issues of homophobia that we confronted all through every campaign that I was involved in. And I first ran in 1994. So I'm happy to talk about all of those things because that was the crucible of my um, sort of strengthening my commitment to um, to public life. And I will just say that at the end of this journey because i'm i'm sort of i'm not the premier anymore obviously um but there's not a day that i haven't felt that it was worth it you know it, it has absolutely been worth every minute tough as it has been so i'm gonna i'm gonna stop there chad but um i'm happy to answer any questions about any of that premier i'm, I'm just gonna go for an experience moment um you know you were a trustee you were an mpp you were a party leader you were premier what was the moment that now sticks out in your mind that you stood there and couldn't believe that it was happening to you? Is there well, one? Yeah, I honestly think, Chad, that the moment when, when Dalton McGinty um, asked me to take on the role of Minister of Education, because I had four portfolios before I became Premier. I'd been in the legislature for three years as the member for Don Valley West. And um, when he asked me to be the Minister of Education, and I, you know, I had a master's in education, I'd worked in education my whole career. Um, it, that moment was really formative in terms of my um, ability to think about operating at that at that higher level. And I loved that job, you know, uh, I'm not going to say I loved it more than being Premier, but I loved being the Minister of Education. So I think that was for me, that was a pretty uh, that was a pretty important transitional moment. So I'm going to remind everyone who's watching uh, that that all those intense questions that are running through your mind that you want to ask uh, or ask me to ask ask on your behalf, you can enter those as we're uh, continuing with the conversation in the online panel. And now we're going to go to Newfoundland and Labrador to a different story and a different experience. Um, Seamus O'Regan, you you know were a political staffer. You uh, uh, supported people from different parties, federal and provincial, then went on to be a journalist who was in, who, you know, you were in our homes every day uh, on a national television network, and then you go back into public life. Um, what, what's your story? How do you, how do you think of uh, your journey up till this point? Oh, oh, wait, are you on mute? Hit it again. How's it? How's it now? We can hear you now. Okay. Okay. Um, sometimes I think your own story takes place on in the backdrop of, of bigger things. Uh, I think um, for me, I, I came out when I was I think thirty four, thirty five. Uh, I that's when I kind of figured it out. Um, went to Catholic school because here in Newfoundland at the time, the only a Catholic or Protestant school. Um, uh, and went to Catholic University. Um, I'm not going to blame that for any sort of repression, but it, it's, it's, it's interesting at the time, one of the biggest political moments for me growing up, and certainly one that affected me hugely, uh, was the, the Hughes Inquiry. Uh, so that's, you know, people our age may remember, Mount Cashel, uh, which was kind of the pinnacle of, of basically systematic uh, Catholic church abuse of young boys, predominantly uh, here in this province. And it was you know, it was kind of the canary in the coal mine for what was happening in the Catholic Church worldwide is, is still dealing with it. It was really bad here. It was nightly news. This inquiry was broadcast live every night. It shook this province. And then when I worked for Brian Tobin afterwards as his policy advisor, probably the most significant thing I've done 
uh, certainly as a staffer, was we had had we had to have a referendum in order to change our, our education system um, mm -hmm. and to have a public school system for the first time. And that, in some ways, was kind of cathartic. Uh, I think for me, not really understanding, I think what was happening. It took me a long time to figure it out, and it was uh, it was not always easy on myself. Um, I would say that. A, a, a tied in passion for me was growing, living here in St. John's, growing, then moving to Labrador at the age of 12 to, you know, a flying fly out community at the time. Kathleen's familiar with it. She was there with Happy Valley, Goose Bay, Labrador, and uh, meeting Indigenous people for the first time, going to school with First Nations, uh, Inuit, and at the time, he self identified as Metis. Um, seeing the racism that took place, uh, being, I think, too young. Although I don't really forgive myself for it, for doing anything about it, um, I I did my undergraduate thesis in in their political mobilization against development that they didn't want. Um, I worked uh, for the Minister of Justice as his executive assistant. I was young, and there was a popular TV show out at the time, so I was nicknamed around Confederation Building uh, Doogie Hauser EA, which some people still call me. Um, uh, I worked. I worked there. I, I went away to Ireland for a year to see how Newfoundland and Labrador could could look at Ireland, especially its IT, uh, its its Celtic Tiger. Um, came back, uh, worked for Brian for two years as his policy advisor, and uh, and then when I did my master's in uh, Indigenous participation in natural resource development, um, and that then I had this crazy wayward turn. It's another story uh, where I enjoyed 14 years as a journalist and, uh, and a broadcast journalist and loved every minute of it. But to be back here now as a Minister of Natural Resources is, uh, is, is um, really, really something, really something for me. Uh, this, is, this is a deep-rooted passion of mine. Um, and I guess, you know, especially as we, lo as we look and we grapple with the movements that are, the movement that's taking place right now, you look at it, you know, through your own lenses. You look at it through your own experiences. Um, for me, uh, it is to it is to grow up uh, confused and yet in I almost self marginalized in terms of my identity, in terms of who I was. Um, but my outward passion, my public passion, was uh, is and continues to be uh, indigenous, full indigenous participation in in our society and our full and empowerment as as peoples. Minister, you know, you're a, you're a national TV personality. People feel they know you and have a relationship with you, even if they haven't met you. You move into public life. What's it like to go through a journey, an identity journey or a struggle and be a public person the entire time? Uh, it took uh, a lot of therapy to figure this out, Chad, but uh, I drank. Okay. To be honest, uh, to be brutally honest, uh, that was my coping mechanism, and it just uh, obviously got a bit too much. I ended up going to rehab five years ago, and uh, been very, very healthy and happy since. Um, so, you know, you I buried it deep, deep, deep. Um, there weren't, I mean, in the eighties and nineties, um, there, you know, it was the eighties, nineties. It wasn't now. I mean, I just, I'm, I am floored all the time by now, by, by where we are now talking, you know, to young people, um, you know, having people who I look up to take public office and be who they are, like Kathleen, um, like uh, Scott Bryson was for me, big time. Um, they, uh, you know, Kathleen and, and Scott and others, they were people whose passions and, and, um, and whose voices I really related to. And, you know, when you saw that they had the courage, then, you know, you, you worked up the courage yourself. Um, but, you know, I, I will say that even it was, I mean, I'm married, uh, we're married 10 years, actually, uh, 10 years um, next month. And uh, it was it was a good five years into my marriage before I, I finally dealt with it. And even then, you know, I, I, I thought it was it had to do with a whole load of other factors, other things I was dealing with at the time. But, you know, I, I really had to kind of sit in it and, and, and deal with a long, a long period of, of repression, self-repression. We're talking about inspiration and in public life today, and, and in both of your introductions, your moment of coming out is an important part of that narrative. Are we part of a quaint generation for whom that won't be part of the politics? Quaint. And I, I've got to admit, <laughs> we're, not, 
We're not as young as some of the people who'd be participating in the conference today who are thinking about their political engagement in life, who a uh, coming out story wouldn't be part of their narrative. It would have been organic to them from the time they had whatever realization uh, 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 in their life. I, I put that question to both of you. Uh, is there a difference in uh, the next generation in terms of how uh, their personal identity and narrative figures into how they might participate as activists or in public life? I'll, I'll put it to Premier Wynne first. Yeah, I, I mean, the, the first thing that comes to my mind, Chad, is that we need to be careful that we don't make assumptions about what people are living. You know, mm -hmm. I think that um, depending on where you are, depending on who your family is, depending on what your circumstances are, um, some of some of the kids who are struggling with their identity may go through a similar experience to kids from our gen from my generation. I mean, you you guys are a lot younger than I am, but um, and I one of the things that worries me is that sometimes in our urban centers or in the big narrative, we assume that we've moved to a place and that everybody is in the same place. Very true. If that were true. If that were true, then everybody would be out who is gay, you know, or who is lesbian, who, or who is uh, queer. And that's not true. Not everyone is out. There are thousands of young and older closeted people who still are experiencing the shame that they can't come to grips with, who cannot be honest with their families and, their, and in their communities. So I think we have to be very careful. I mean, only a few months ago, just before this whole pandemic started, I was on Church Street with a group of religious leaders who were confronting, a, you know, a, a right wing church group who were attacking us. That's 2020, you know? Yeah. So I think we have to be careful, Chad. And one of the reasons that I say yes to doing things like this is that I I want to be part of answering the questions and supporting young people in um, being who they are and being their, their authentic selves. I don't think we're there yet. And that's, so I think that's, uh, that's the cautionary note we need to put into this discussion. I think, and I want to, uh, if I could build chat on, on what Kathleen has to say, it's the reason why I do it too, is that I just keep reminding people of vigilance. Uh, mm -hmm. You know, this, the fact that I am here and I'm now married 10 years, uh, what we've witnessed, uh, those of us of this quaint generation have witnessed is a, um, one of the largest civil rights victories in, in human history. Um, but as things can, can be granted, things can be taken away. You know, and or there will though there will be those who will try to, even if it is on an individual basis. Yeah. So you have to remain vigilant. You know, you constantly remain vigilant. When you acquire it in your life and you appreciate that, as as I have, as you know, as a as as a conscious as an adult to see it not to not have it and to have it means that you know what it is to not have it and you really appreciate it. So there's no resting on the laurels. Mm -hmm. And, you know, as Kathleen said, you can't speak to everybody's individual circumstances. Otherwise, everybody would be happy and out if, if you know, if that's what they need to be. I mean, it, it's there are still many, many people who struggle. And uh, I grew up in a very uh, accepting and progressive household that was deeply relieved in my parents <laughs> that I finally got around to doing this um, and very, very happy. I couldn't ask for better. And I knew that. Um, and sometimes, so sometimes there's not even anything rational that you could point to yourself at the time. Everybody's experience in this is, is different. Um, but what I do acknowledge, and, and, I, and I, you know, you have to acknowledge the, the incredible change that has happened because of, of people who fought for these rights in our lifetime, because mm -hmm. it emboldens us to do what has, what has to happen next, what we're seeing around us right now. You know, we know we can do this. We know that we can make lives better we can know we know that we can make lives matter because we've seen it we've done it and while we have to maintain vigilance on that front it, it means that we can we can change and and just on the vigilance piece chad you know um to seamus's point <laughs> the last four three four years in ontario we saw a battle about sex education yeah. The curriculum, the sex education curriculum. Now, you know, you can argue 
you know, the till you're blue in the face, that it was about it was about the wrong words being used, or you know, it was the the information being presented at too early a, a stage. It was about homophobia. Charles McVitie took it on. He took it on in 2010 when I was Minister of Education. We brought the curriculum in. Dalton McGinty, McGinty withdrew it. So it was it was rooted in homophobia. And so we had a battle right through Doug Ford winning his leadership by saying he would repeal the sex education curriculum and then not doing it. You know, so so there really there really is a ton of evidence that that vigilance is exactly what is needed. And what do you think the message for kids living in small communities in Ontario was when they saw that battle on the lawn of Queen's Park and the horrible things that were being said about me and about, uh, about us, you know, was that going to encourage them to come out and feel safe? No. That was that it was not. And unless they had a good teacher or someone who could create some safety for them in their own environment, their family, then they were going to stay quiet longer than they would have otherwise. So I just think that, you know, we don't have to look very far or very far back in history to find the need for vigilance. Well, it's a, it's a good natural segue to a question we've gotten from uh, someone who's joined us online. And Premier, I'm going to throw it to you first. In our education system, how would you work to remove bias? The bias that holds us back, that permeates in the system, what would be a change you would make uh, to remove the bias we're passing on to another generation of kids? Well, I did make some changes as Minister of Education. You know, we brought in an equity policy. Mike Harris before us had literally taken the word equity out of all of the education documents in the Ministry of Education in between 1995 and 2003. Um, when I became Minister of Education, we reintroduced those concepts. We reintroduced the curriculum that would allow teachers. There were good educators all over the province who were doing this work, but there were some who weren't and some who needed support. So we brought in a curriculum. We, we, em, we em, sort of embedded um, equity into the Education Act in Ontario, and um, and that that became part of the Safe School movement in uh, in Ontario. So I think that the legislation and the framework, the statutes that are in place, are very very important. But more important is the training that our teachers get, the community work that is done to support the work that. Um, create safe environments for kids. You know, um, I said earlier that I had worked in conflict resolution. You know, one of the things that I did, I went into schools all across the province for a decade and we would start with a conversation about conflict resolution and conflict in the playground. But that conversation would kind of blossom into who's bullying whom, what are they saying to you? What are the words that are being used? What do they mean? And start to examine the groups that were pitting themselves against one another. So, um, so I think that training is extremely, extremely important. Until human beings in, examine their own biases, and this is relevant to the conversation that's being had right yeah. now about anti-black racism. You know, um, we we live in a society where systemic bias exists. We have internalized homophobia. You know, I was 37 years old when I came out. Don't tell me I wasn't homophobic. I was, I was scared to death about who I was gonna become, you know, and how people were gonna see me. So I had to look at that. I did years of therapy. Um, and so teachers and administrators and, and legislators, if I can say, need to look at their assumptions. Because if we don't do that, if we don't provide the opportunity for that kind of examination, how can we possibly create an environment for kids? So I think that kind of training, the professional development that's needed is fundamental to creating um, a safer education system for kids. So Minister, where, where is somewhere, I, I know education is not a federal priority, I'm, I'm not trying to uh, set a trap for you um, uh, to jump jurisdictions, but where is an example of bias that you think we could work on removing or changing? Oh my gosh. Um, uh, I don't know. I mean, I, it, you're right. It doesn't really have jurisdiction. I mean, I think, I think Kathleen's pointed to some very pointed areas where we can help. I think that, you know, if you grew up in a small town in the North, 
Um, it's, uh, you know, and, and this isn't to kind of paint all small towns with a sweeping brush. Some can be, you know, wonderfully progressive and open. And, but, you know, generally, you know, the story has always gone that, you, you know, w w kids leave towns because they are more suffocating. Maybe even, you know, just in terms of like, you know, all the same people and, and you know, it, it, it may not even be necessarily anything that people are, are imparting upon you, um, but you just, you're suffocated. So, you know, the, you go to the big city. I mean, that's been the story for decades. You go to Toronto, you might go to Calgary, and, you know, Vancouver, and um, I'm, I'm, I'm always thinking about who I was and I'm always thinking of the kid in the small town. Uh, you know, I remember when we got married, um, we, we wanted to keep it very private and we, we weren't going to uh, do any publicity. And, uh, you know, we, we had 300 people here and, and we, had, we had it in Newfoundland and it was, it was a great wedding. And Hello Magazine was just starting up and they wanted to do, uh, you know, a, a, a pictorial and, and we said no. And uh, a good friend of mine said, uh, yeah, you will you'll do it and and you'll do it not only for the 15 year old who may pick that up in the dentist's office and take a look at it uh you'll do it for his mother and father mm -hmm. and um and it, so we did it <laughs> you know that and i've never forgotten that i've never forgotten that i think that there's uh there's something to be said for example and there's something to be said for conversations like this um and the younger that you can have those conversations the better i mean i you know i I always, you know, it, it sounds, it sounds very obvious, but I always make a real point of introducing my husband as my husband mm -hmm. and to everyone. And it's something that we both very deliberately do. We've never actually explained why, but we both know why. And, uh, and this, you know, this is how my nieces and nephews and this is how my friends' kids grow up and this is what they know. And that might be a bit of a woke audience, but, um, it's, it's how I've carried myself in public life too. Just unapologetic and, you know, much like Kathleen. Um, I'm going to thing, though, the, oh, sorry, I was just going to say the language. Um, one of the things that I, I want to talk a little bit about today is the, the intersection between feminism and homophobia and, uh, you know, being a woman first and then discovering I was a lesbian. And um, I don't use the word wife, interestingly. Yeah. I say partner, Jane and I introduce each other as our partners. Um, and I always say, you know, I'd been married before and I'd been a wife and I didn't think the institution was so shit hot, you know? So, so I, use, I use partner. And the reason we got married was yeah. our kids. We got married in 2005, but we've been together since 1991. Um, but our kids said, you have to do this because you can. Yeah. You know, and it was that modeling. And it turned out that for Jane's mother in particular, it was extremely important that we were married in the United Church. It then became real to her. And for the first time in 30 years, she stopped hassling Jane about being a lesbian because oh. somehow the um, the stamp of approval was there. And it's like she could understand it better you know mm -hmm. um but but i just wanted to comment that i don't use wife and i'm sure yeah. there are people who would castigate me for that but i don't yeah. we we have some folks uh i have another question from the audience and they're asking about for, for folks who would think that they might want to consider a public life or a political life they're worried about that other part of coming out which is their social media history and living a very public life online and then deciding to come into politics. What advice do you have for folks coming from a new generation where they've lived a very public recorded life and uh, how, how do you sanitize that record? Do you acknowledge it? Do you own it? What is the, the dimension for folks who might want to run for public office of all that public living they've done uh, on Twitter and Facebook and TikTok and elsewhere? Yeah, I mean, our generation uh, you know, came to social media at a later, at a later age, uh, maybe we, when, you know, with, with mid adulthood, you're kind of inherently more cautious. Um, my theory has always been, and it has yet to be proven that because social media is so pervasive now, and because we're dealing with, and I'm sure a number of, of people who are watching, um, you know, have grown up with it and therefore have their teen years and their 
God help me. I can't imagine my undergrad years being on, on TikTok. <laughs> um, but, but you know, they, they, that, that's there. My, my hope is that it all kind of cancels one another out and that the sensationalism of, of digging and look what we found, you know, from Seamus O'Regan's second year at McIsaac House at St. X University, God help me. Um, you know, that, that those splashes kind of negate one another because people aren't just gonna, just aren't gonna tolerate it anymore. I think that is being played out right now, I think in real time, because, that, because this generation is coming of age and is entering public life. And I think this is a bit of a great experiment. I'm really hoping that that's the case because, you know, one thing that I have learned with time is that time is finite. And, it, you know, if you are spending your time talking about what you did on TikTok and Twitter 20 years ago, 15 years ago, whatever, 10 years ago, that is time you are not talking about meaningful change. That is time mm -hmm. you are not talking about why you have probably entered into public life. So uh, that's more aspirational than instructional. Um, instructionally, uh, just the obvious, oh my God, stay away from replies on Twitter, like just stay away. <laughs> and I, I can feel when I've had enough, I'm in tune well enough now with my mental health that I know, and I will tell my staff, I'm off Twitter, I'm off. And I've, uh, most I've taken off is a year. I just went, I write my stuff. That's really important to me that I write my stuff. That's my voice. And I, so it takes a longer period of time, but it, it's not done by committee. I write my stuff. Uh, it's just a matter of whether or not I'm on it and scrolling and looking at my feed. And, you know, I, cut, I got back on it with, the, with COVID only because the amount of information and sometimes very useful information was terrific. Um, you know, voices that I would not have heard before and would not look up in more mainstream publications that I would seek out. So, you know, I, I would say when you're entering public life, um, and Kathleen, I'll leave it to you, but I mean, you, it, you are definitely more vulnerable. Um, you know, uh, I, you know, you, you continue to see uh, words that we don't use anymore that I used all the time in the 80s and 90s that describe uh, gay men uh, all the time. Uh, or will refer to um, my, you know, the, you know, the fact that I, I drank, that always comes up. So that stuff, and listen, that stuff accumulatively, I am not afraid to say can get to you. Mm -hmm. If you see, if you are online all the time on social media and you see hundreds of people repeating that, and it, you know, that's happened to me. It happened to me while I was in rehab, which was, I don't know why I got on Twitter then, but anyway, uh, that can have an accumulative effect. And it's okay to say that and okay to say enough, like enough. And I'm not sure if uh, the liabilities of cutting yourself off um, are, are so great that, you know, if, you're, if, you're, if you feel the anxiety, it's worth it. If, if well, there's nothing worse than anxiety. Minister, I, I hear what you're saying. In fact, it's a segue to another question more than one panelist has asked as, as we pivot over to Premier Wynn. I mean, you've taken hits from all sides. You have been a Premier who has been uh, uh, litigated extensively uh, uh, before office and in office. Two parts to the question, is the toll worth it uh, of the case that's made against you? And what would you tell people who are about to jump headfirst into the same struggle? Well, as I said in my opening remarks, the toll is worth it because we changed people's lives in this province. Um, we, you know, to my mind, we demonstrated some things that were possible that people hadn't thought were possible before. You know, you cannot raise the minimum wage. You can't have free tuition. You can't put more money into violence against women. You can't, you know, and, and you can. We did. Yes, Doug Ford is rolling some of those things back, but but we demonstrated that we could move forward in those in those directions. So, um, so I think it is absolutely worth it. Um, what would I say? I mean, it's interesting because I obviously had no social media history when I got into politics. When I first ran in 1994, you know, I don't didn't even have a cell phone. So, um, so I have a different experience. But what I did have was a past. We all have a past. You know, and in politics, the people who hate you or who want others to hate you are going to dig up your past. That's just that's the fact. And I always talk about the Norma Ray moment with um, with my kids where, you know, there's that scene in, in Norma Ray where she hauls her kids out of bed and she said, OK, 
they're going to be saying bad things about your mama. <laughs> and I said to my kids, you know, we're going into this together. Um, it's going to be tough. But here's why I want to do it. Here's why it's important. And I tried to protect the kids to the best of my ability. Um, now, the fact of social media means that um, the journalists don't have to dig as hard. You know, the, the stuff is all there. It's laid out for them. Um, and as Seamus has said, I think that the vitriol from one side is going to somehow cancel out the vitriol from the other. And the vitriol about one person is going to cancel out the vitriol about another, which is a sad thing to say about our society. But maybe... You know, if the underbelly is just all out there and you can see it, then we can just leave it and move on. We compartmentalize it. And that's the final thing that I say to young people is, you know, you're going to get up in the morning and you're going to either look at Twitter or you're going to look at TikTok or you're going to read the newspaper, whatever your way of getting at what's going on in the world is. You're going to see those things and it's going to be tough. And maybe you go for a run, maybe you don't. But at some point, you have to find that box that you put it in. And you close the lid on that box and then you go and you do your work. And if at some point in the day you need to peek into that box for some reason, just to check what's going on, fair enough. But you do need to find a way to put it aside because if, if you let it take over every hour of your day, then you're just going to be despairing. It's, it's not possible to hear the vile things about you. It's like when the press would say to me, What's it like to be so unpopular? What's it like to be the least popular premier in the country? Well, what the hell do you think it's like? You know, it's it's not fun. It's a drag. But does that stop me from making policy decisions? No. Does it stop me from meeting people with people? No, because that's what the job is about. So I think that I think there are all sorts of ways of coping with this nastiness. I do believe that we're going to have to figure out what the rules are. We're going to have to figure out what the lines are. And I didn't grow up with it. So, you know, I kind of leave it to the next generation to sort that out. Okay. Um, we um, share a bit of background commonality. Uh, and when we walk into rooms with other political and public affairs people, while there may be diversities of ideology, uh, or religion or background too often we're all of the same race and we're all cisgendered and we all had pretty lucky backgrounds uh, in the first uh, 15 to 20 years of our lives. So to the young activists who are on the line, um, what is the practical advice you give as people who've succeeded in our practitioners power of pulling more people to the table who don't look like us, haven't had the story, and maybe weren't as lucky as we were in the first 15 or 20 years. What advice do you give them as activists in helping themselves, their friends, their others? What what do you tell them to ignore and push through so that there are um, the, the, there is a greater diversity of gender and background and ethnocultural uh, um, uh, persuasion uh, around the tables of power? Uh, Premier, I'll go to you first. Well, I think I think that um, you know my own practice was to, to the greatest degree possible, be intentional about bringing other voices in, and and that can that can be the actual people who are on staff. Um, and I will say I probably wasn't as successful at that as I wish I had been because there's a a self perpetuating nature of the the sort of political class, and so. Um, I think we were more successful with some of my ministers. They brought in people from their experience and their sectors and, and we had more diversity there. Um, but I also think that no matter who you've got sitting at those decision-making tables, the way government, the only way government can work well is if the people who are making decisions are talking to people who are on the outside, who are on the front line, who are not anywhere near the political class, you know, which is why, for example, when the Black Lives Matter um, crew came to Queen's Park in 2016, I went out and talked to them and we drew them into a conversation with Michael Coteau. It's why I tried whenever I could to engage with people who were not elected, who were not part of a, a political party necessarily, but who were on the front line because that's the way the exchange of ideas works. And that's an ongoing process, Chad. That's not, that's not a one-off. That's every single issue. You got to figure out who's making, who's, on the front line having to live this and how does that inform what we decide in government 
and go to them go to them go to them physically and emotionally go to them go to where they are i mean if yeah. i um as as a minister at veterans affairs and and especially indigenous services um you know i i'm not sitting in ottawa asking people to come to me i'm going to them i'm going to community i grew up in a small town i know what it's i know the difference between being asked to come <laughs> and and government coming to me those decision makers coming to me so you know and it doesn't have to be you know uh heading out to somewhere nationally uh or you know to northern saskatchewan to nunavut you know as i've had the great uh, privilege of doing it can mean going to a neighborhood where they are and where they are active and where they grew up and and their experience and getting a feel for that and respecting that um that's important as well as emotionally being there for them listening listening okay. listening listening it is um it's it, it is a means but sometimes i tell you listening is an end in some ways it is so mm -hmm. important you know, mm -hmm. it is, and it has never been more important to Kathleen's point too, at the top of this conversation, talking about the individual experiences that people have. Listen. Uh, someone has asked, uh, you know, and, and it's that thing where you create demand. Uh, is there any Canadian out there uh, now who's a public voice that you wish would enter public office? Is there anyone out there, uh, uh, maybe from a different community or who's charting a career as an activist, you wish uh, uh, would step up and run for office? I know it's an on the spot question from the audience. So uh, uh, I'll, I'll here's, what, here's what's even more complicated about it. I don't want to name them because I want them to go into public life. Oh. I, don't, I don't want to, I, I honestly do. And I don't want to break them. Suffice it to say that I have met so many impressive indigenous First Nations, Métis, Inuit voices uh, over my years uh, from right across the country. And I actually think they they will enter public life. I actually I think you know the ones I'm thinking of they will enter public life, um, and and you know I'm going to keep an eye on a lot of them and support them where I can. Uh, um, I'm greatly heartened actually by the leadership coming out of the indigenous uh, out of our indigenous communities. Yeah, you know I just can I just can I just do a little diversion there. Um, I, uh, it's one of the things that worried me very much about our the makeup of our legislature was the lack of uh, Indigenous voices uh, and the lack of diversity in general, although it's better, obviously, than it was 25 years ago. Um, but uh, we, may, we had a Northern Boundary Commission. Uh, we put it in place at the end of my term and created two new Northern ridings. And I remember at the time, um, and one of the reasons I wanted to do it was I wanted ridings that were going to be the vast majority indigenous people. Mm -hmm. And um, I remember there were voices saying to me, but Kathleen, you know, we probably won't win those ridings. And we didn't just for the record. <laughs> but for me, that was not the point. The point was to get those different voices. Um, I think that, I think that the, um, there are people in those, ethnic communities that I um, that I really wish would would step up. Um, I also think and I know this is a this is a Chamber of Commerce event. And I, I just want to say that I think that there are many, many small, medium and large size business leaders, female, male, whatever the background, um, who don't step into politics. I don't know if it's because of the money. I don't know if it's because they they don't want to be put under public scrutiny. I think all of those things come into come into play. But I I do think that certainly at the provincial level, um, we could use we could use more of those voices. People who have run successful businesses, who have um, you know who have maybe been very successful successful or or not as successful but i think those voices are necessary we do you know we do have a wide range of experience in our political class but i think sometimes there are people who shy away from it because they've been in the private sector and they think that somehow there's a conflict between private and public sector to me that is a 
false, false conflict. We are absolutely interconnected. And I think this COVID, I, I saw one of the questions on the chat board. I mean, this COVID, this pandemic has demonstrated the extent to which the private sector and the public sector have to work together. Yeah. Otherwise, we don't have a successful, successful society. So I'd like to see more of those folks. And maybe after this, we will see them step forward. Um, I, I'm going to uh, take the prerogative of uh, last question. Um, on May 27th, uh, uh, Larry Kramer uh, passed away. So a great activist, great playwright. To anyone on the uh, line who is uh, not familiar with him, I uh, uh, highly suggest his body of work. But he would say that um, too often we're polite and uh, we don't move uh, far enough, fast enough as activists because we're not willing to admit we're angry and who we're angry about and what we need to tell people they need to be angrier about. As we talk to folks who are thinking about public life and activism and, you know, we've seen in recent weeks the importance of bearing witness and being loud. Uh, is there anything that you're angry about that you wish people were talking about more that you'd say it's okay to admit you're angry about. We've talked a lot about how far we've come. Uh, is there anything that, that it's okay to say, no, I'm angry, and, and people have to go out and scream and yell about this a, a heck of a lot more? Pre Premier, I'll throw it to you first. Chad, I'm constantly angry. <laughs> I wrote to my colleague, one of my colleagues yesterday, you know, sometimes I just don't know what to do with the rage and the sadness. Um, and I was thinking about books that have, that I've leaned on over the years. And I went back to my time when I met as at Oise and I was doing feminist studies and, you know, the poetry of Audre Lorde and Adrian Rich and the, um, you know, the raw intersection of lesbianism and feminism and the silencing of women for me for me that's not over you know i i see too many little girls certainly too many little girls of color who don't feel that they have the right to speak up that they look they look at me and they say you know how do i get there how is it possible and um that makes me it makes me sad more than angry maybe that's just because of my age but i but i certainly um i certainly think that um we have we have not we have not done enough as a society to recognize that we haven't we haven't made the playing field level for so many kids and i would say you know girls are girls are still fighting those battles and you know, we talk about the she session and we talk about this pandemic and how important caring has been. It is women who have done that work. It is women who have been paid shit for decades, for centuries. And, you know, when I tried to suggest when I was premier that we should be putting in place universal child care, that we should raise the minimum wage, honest to God, that was about women having more access you know and i had colleagues say to me you know we wouldn't be having this conversation if it weren't a woman in leadership so that can i can go on a long time about that chat i won't but that's what uh that's what i carry and i think we need we need anger channeled into action minister i know you know sitting minister of natural resources it's dangerous to ask you what you're angry about and get you on no, the road no, no. What, what, what do we need to be uh, angrier about? What do we need to be fighting for and screaming about at the top of our lungs? Uh, the most common phrase used in my house is by my husband to me, which he says in his Greek baritone, which is calm down, just calm down. Now, that's, that's a progression because when he says settle down, that just sets me off. I, I can't deal with settle down. Uh, <laughs> calm down, I can abide. Um, what, what still, uh, infuriates me in politics is people who will still use the tools of government to repress people. Um, you know, and you see it, uh, I think, a, a, you know, a, a repression of, of the trans movement uh, all the time. Um, I always repeat again and again, you know, to be who you are, to love who you choose, but to be who you are and who are so many people to deny people their experience and their identity and who they want to be. It amazes me that that still exists as, as much as it does. Um, that angers me. Um, the systemic racism that I grew up with uh, against indigenous people that I know, that I've seen, that I've, uh, that I've absorbed, that has propelled me in, into public life, both at a young age and later in life. 
that still gets me angry. Um, and the voices that I hear from people's experiences that I don't know either primarily or secondarily, I am listening and I'm getting, and, and it, it, this, what's happening right now is very real. This is real. This is, this is, um, and, and we'll see where it goes. I just know that, you know, when I, when I was at the rally on, on Saturday here in St. John's, Newfoundland, and I, I posted a sign on, on Twitter where this woman had, and it had, a map, it had a map of Newfoundland and it just said, it happens here too. Yeah. And, I, uh, um, and it was so, that was so powerful to me. And then, you know, you get home and you feel empowered and then you were reminded when you go online, uh, what are you doing? With that, um, what are you doing? That's the question for me that, that, I powerful, need to answer, that we need to answer. On that powerful note of close, uh, I have to fulfill my obligation of holding us to the time we've been allotted today. Uh, uh, Minister of Natural Resources, uh, Seamus O'Regan, uh, former Premier and MPP for Don Valley West, uh, Kathleen Wynne, uh, thank you today for, for sharing your story and uh, for taking the questions of our panelists to the Canadian Gay, Lesbian and Gay Chamber of Commerce. Thank you for providing us with this forum, uh, for figuring out a way to still come together and connect at a time of pandemic when there's a health and economic crisis changing the way we all have to learn to live and communicate and connect with each other. I'd encourage everyone to consider a donation or membership if you haven't already looking at the uh, amazing services that the Canadian Lesbian and Gay Chamber of Commerce offers. So with that, uh, thank you very much for your time today. And with hope that uh, if there's one thing our panelists have communicated to you, it is the power of action and despite the cost uh, that it's 100% worth it. Thank it you. Is.